All right. So I hope to cover a lot today. So we'll cut, sort of blow through a bit. Some of it's some of it's fresh, like into my ears or sort of off the press. Um, I just sat in a meeting today with a deputy director um, for the um, for Marin County um, Department of Public Health, and so she shared some slides that I sort of captured. I'm going to share with you that are unpublished data, but it's sort of um, stuff that's going to they're hoping to put into the CDC's MMWR. I think in the next week or the week after. So, um, so let's go through. Like, start with um, what I thought we'd do is start with a few different, just posing some questions. And I'm hopeful those questions will help sort of answer some of your questions. And there's, I'm sure there's plenty of other questions to be had. So we'll save time towards the back half to, to explore some of those questions that you may have. So, um, you know, the first question would like, how many people have been infected with COVID? How many people have been vaccinated? How many people do you need to achieve herd immunity? How long, if you're infected, are you sort of, you know, preserved um, from getting reinfected? And what does that look like statistically? And if you're vaccinated, how long will that last? Which we don't fully have an answer to, but I'll sort of address that as well. So, um, you know, looking at the CDC data, some of you may know this, the estimate is about roughly one in five, call it, of positive cases that have been diagnosed by, um, by testing. Um, one in, it represents one out of five cases that actually exist nationally. So the thought being that there's actually roughly 83 million people that have been in, infected and one fifth of those have been actually tested positive. So for every test that's positive, you can anticipate a total of five cases represented by that one person that was tested. And that really just speaks to the poor access that, that people have to testing as well as people being asymptomatic. So that's a lot of people, right? So that's roughly, uh, you know, 20, 25% of the population. Um, and if you look at it, you know, across age group, you can see <clears throat> the prevalence here um, under estimate of a total of 83 million. <clears throat> you can see most, most of them are in the large age group between 18 and 50 years of age. And, um, and you can see here um, that um, as you sort of, as you get older, there's fewer and fewer cases, but as you know, the mortality risk goes up, particularly at uh, greater than 75 years of age. So if you look at you know, 26 million cases, how many people have been vaccinated? It looks like around 34 million people have been vaccinated. We're coming up on a half a million deaths, unfortunately. But you can see cases in the United States are on the decline in the past 30 days. We'll look at that from Marin County as well. Um, but deaths, as you know, are usually a month behind cases. So that you, we don't see, see much of a change yet in the death rate. Um, if you look at Marin County, um, you can see here that the estimate is that um, the percent of Marin County population who have received at least one dose of vaccines is about 10%. So now for, um, and what we know is um, there are about 10,000 people that have been diagnosed with in Marin County um, by testing. So the estimate is about 50,000 people, therefore have been infected is the, is the extrapolation based on the national data and looking locally, they've sort of confirmed those same rates in their seroprevalence to, to testing they've done in the Bay Area. The population here is about 240,000 in Marin County. So that gives you, you know, roughly 20, 22% uh, of folks uh, have been infected in Marin County and 10% have been vaccinated. There's, there is some overlap you know, amongst those that have been infected that don't know it and got, went and got vaccinated. Although most of the people that have been tested are in the upper age groups, as you can see here um, and from Marin County, you can see that um, of the 12,000 people that are 75 and older in Marin County, about half have been vaccinated and you can see the proportions um, listed here. So, um, if you look at sort of the um, the one big factor I should I should speak to, although as I look at this data, it, it, it must be the zero to sixteen age group that makes up the remainder of that two hundred forty thousand because this doesn't add up to two hundred forty thousand uh, people in, in Marin County. Um, but if you go back here, ten percent of the population have been vaccinated, and you can see it's the big emphasis has been the seventy five and older group. Uh, first healthcare providers and then the 75 and older group. Um, 
And the reason being, you can see the headline up top here is what we learned, what I learned today and why there's been such so much, so many challenges here. This, they're only getting 650 doses per week for the entire county. So you've got a county of 200, quarter million people and they're getting 650 new doses. Clearly that's a problem. Um, they originally were getting, um, were able to do 1200 doses per day and they set up a vaccine center based on that. Um, and they sort of ramped up and then all of a sudden their allocation was reduced from the state level to the county, Marin County. Similar problems happen in San Francisco as well. If you look at LA County, I was looking at some of the data, you can see they've received 10 times as much um, of the vaccines as the Bay Area has received. Um, and that may be a population discrepancy. I haven't looked at that, but clearly there's some differences in how things are being allocated. In part, it might be due to bur disease burden and prevalence. And um, I think I may show you some data here. I'm not sure if I included it, but basically in the past couple of weeks, three, four weeks, the case, the incidence has really dropped down in Marin County and in San Francisco, and we may move to red uh, by next week is what the deputy director indicated. Although related, she's concerned with the Super Bowl that is actually going to now people are going to gather and it may bounce back up the week after that, unfortunately. Um, so that gives you a sense of what's going on and why it's been so difficult. I spoke to them about because I put an application in. We've been approved by the state. Now we're waiting for a review at the county level. She's one of the people responsible for reviewing our application. And I asked about that and she said that actually these 650 doses she's going to be allocating to people like our medical practice. And the thought being she would give us one or two or three vials, which is really 10 doses per vial, so that we can get to our 75 years of age and older population. Um, there's to look at sort of who's been vaccinated or who's been doing the vaccinations. You can see here at, for Marin County, uh, the county itself, uh, the Department of Public Health has done almost half of those vaccinations. And then you can see that who else makes the remainder. Um, we know, for example, Walgreens was doing uh, vaccinating here in Mill Valley at Shoreline. Uh, and they, you know, one day they had extra vaccines we found out, the extra doses left over. And um, we found out after the fact, we called them and they said they're no longer vaccinating. So it's hit and miss how things are going here. Uh, Kaiser has their own source of vaccines. It, it wasn't clear to me how the allocation is going for the pharmacies. I believe they, they have their own sourcing and so does Sutter Health and One Medical. Uh, One Medical's really been, um, been told to, they have to restrict their vaccinations to 75 and older within Marin County because that is the guidelines for Marin County. Apparently they may have been vaccinating people 65 years of age to 75 and that's no longer permitted. Um, so what's going on now is really everyone's also trying to push back and forth to creating an alliance where they can, if there's extra doses in, in Sutter, they shift it over to the county, or if there's extra doses at Kaiser, they shift it over to Sutter. Like, so they're trying to create an alliance where all these vaccines are being well utilized. Um, so that's sort of how things are moving through at the county level here in Marin County. And my understanding is it's very similar scenarios and shortages that are happening in San Francisco uh, and the East Bay. So moving on, if there's more questions, feel free to throw those out as we come along here. But um, let me just keep moving through and, and move on to some other questions is, so how do we think about socializing? Uh, because vaccine is not gonna happen anytime soon for many of us. Um, and so the, the, how do we go about continuing to live our lives? Um, I, you know, For the most part, really everyone should be doing as we have historically been doing, which is really to keep our social groups quite small um, and to you know, maintain that social distancing and masking. Um, if you are, you know, if someone's coming to visit or you have, you know, family members that you want to move to the Bay Area or you need to go travel or whatever, whatever these things, sorts of scenarios occur, then the question is, how do you manage that? Um, and um, let me just sort of address this a twofold manner. People that get the rapid testing done, it's really important to know what kind of tests you're getting done. As many of you know, uh, we have a PCR-based machine, which is really the gold standard. Um, and, and that's the one on the left here, the Cepheid machine is what we have. Um, for some reason, the Avid ID now gained a lot of traction is in all those urgent cares 
uh, that Go Health is running and others. And those are only, as you see here, 50%, they're calling it 50% plus uh, sensitive, meaning that even if you have a negative, your odds, there's a 50% chance it's a false negative. Now, truth be told, what we've learned a little bit better now is that um, in the infectious period, it's probably about 80 to 90% good, meaning that if you're infectious right now, there's enough virus replicating in you right now. If you take that narrow population, the test performs better. One out of 10 chance, you're, we're still missing it. Um, if you take the full spectrum of when you might have virus in you, where the PCR, for example, the one the machine on the left, the Cepheid, would actually identify that you have virus in you. Because the way the PCR is, is, is it's a preliminary, preliminary chain reaction. So it, it takes the any viral particle that it picks up and then amplifies it in the machine so it can detect it. So even if you're not infectious, meaning you have some virus in you, but it's not enough to be in, to infect others, and you yourself may not be what was most likely asymptomatic, it will detect it. And that happens on the two ends of the curve, right? Before you get infected and on the backside of your infection, which is probably why, for example, our former president um, really um, didn't want to get retested because the demand would have been for PCR and he would have remained positive quite long by PCR standards after he was no longer infectious. So it's a qualitative measure versus a positive negative to really understand when you're no longer infectious. So the Abbott machine, the problem is you go and get tested. Let's pretend it's a true negative because you're not infectious, but maybe two days later, you then become infectious and it missed, it missed that window. So you want a PCR based machine um, that will tell you if you're infectious. I'll give you a, an example. We, I had a, a friend who was exposed to someone who turned out to be, turned out later to figure out that he would, had COVID and he most likely infected his friend because they sat together, spent time unmasked in close quarters together and drove in a car together. So he then didn't know that was with his family subsequent to that exposure. So then day later finds out, his friend calls, says, I'm COVID positive, you need to get tested. So the classic scenario is you wait five days to see that's the, ma the maximum time when you have the most likelihood of catching a positive test. You quarantine for that time, go on day five, get tested. But he asked me the question, which is, uh, and I haven't seen any data support this, but logically seems true, which is his concern was that I exposed my family. So I was with my friend on Friday, on Saturday, I'm with my family. If I get tested on Monday, which was the next day that he could get tested, which is not, which is only day three. But if I get tested in my negative by PCR, then my chances of having infected my family are, and in my mind, the answer is quite remote because if the PCR test cannot detect any virus in you after amplification, then clearly the odds of you having infected your family members two days prior are quite remote. And it turns out his family member, it was negative for him. His family members never turned positive. He then turned positive two days later but his family members actually never turn positive. So that's the, this test and gather strategies. I hope that's somewhat helpful. The bottom line is choose the gold standard. Um, you want to just know for, as best you can. And thankfully we were able to secure the right machine for uh, the Cepheid machine and for you and your friends and anyone else that's trying to get tested, make sure they ask for, is it a PCR based rapid machine? The other tests that are coming out that uh, is this home-based test that uses LAMP technology, which is a, a variant on the PCR technology, which was originally designed for influenza. And um, the, the, the initial data says that it's about 98% sensitive. We'll see as the data comes out, whether that pr proves true. It's a home-based test. Um, I may be able to get access to this, this test. Uh, it's a home-based one, and if you, Please let me know if you want access to this. Um, we'll have to do a large bulk order. So I'll talk more about this in the future and then email the folks to see if we need, if people want to purchase it. But I, I need to purchase at least 500 units. So it needs to be uh, uh, quite large of an order. This one is thought to be quite good. There are other tests coming out now as well. There's a new one by another company that is, uh, uh, doesn't require a prescription. This one does. Uh, that one doesn't perform quite as well as this one does by Lucera. So um, 
how let's talk about schools for a moment because the plan is to move towards opening schools uh, in Marin County. This data is the data I was mentioning earlier on. It's a, unpublished right now, but they plan to publish this through uh, morbidity and uh, mortality uh, weekly report through the CDC. And what they what they found is putting kids in school is actually a good thing. Um, what they, you'll see here, this graph, uh, the red line shows that the number of COVID cases in the community, um, and you can see how they're dropping over time. And then if you look at the green line, you could say the cumulative number of students that are COVID positive. Um, and that was a total of nine students um, most recently that is school related. And what you can, what they then go on to show here is that um, you can look at sort of schools, the blue line, the total number of students in K through eight in school for the specified week. You can see how there's an increase in, in folks come the new year here uh, in school, and yet there's a decline, the red line in number of cases. And then they go on to look at it over time and they show these different intervals, the increase in cases they attribute in over the summer due to the relaxation of strong safety precautions. Then you move into the fall and you can see declining cases with the schools reopening because some schools were, were reopened in Marin, although not the schools that I know of, but there were including in Sausalito. And then they show another increase here in cases likely due to social gatherings over the holidays. Um, they go on to show that there's been a total of nine cases identified through school related transmission. And that's amongst a total of a million days or 890,000 days, school days of students. Uh, those nine school, nine cases, zero of cases were student to adult transmission. There was one adult to student transmission that resulted in two students getting infected. And then the remainder were student to student transmission. So they really, and you could see here uh, that there was no, by grade level, by transmission pathway, uh, there was really no um, commonality that they could find, private school, public school, or transmission pathway. This was all, location was all among school, hence the blue lines showing that all cases were on, like the transmission occurred on school grounds. So that's pretty, quite, quite reassuring. Um, and they're gonna put this data out there and really try and put kids back in school, K through eight in particular, and you know, obviously following the appropriate precautions. I know it makes a lot of us nervous, uh, but they're data-based decision-making and it looks quite promising um, and clearly good for the children's uh, learning, morale and social activity. So and we're, as we reopen, I wanna spend some time talking about how do we behave um, I was, I should have put a picture of, I was in San Francisco the other day, picking up food, uh, doing stuff. And then we thought, oh, we're in the city. We'll pick up some food to, to go. And we were horrified to see what we saw. And uh, the reason being is ventilation. So they, they've set up in, in the marina on Scott, we, um, they set up these uh, sort of parklets, right? But it was on the sidewalk. They don't have room on the street. They didn't want to take up um, parking spaces on the street or close down any streets. So it's sitting on the sidewalk. And what you have is a wall on one side, a window, I should say, sort of, you know, facing the street. You've got a glass ceiling on the other side, and then you've got a floor on the bottom, and you've got an opening here. So this is where the outdoor comes from, because one wall is free. Then about six or eight feet over, you've got a 30, 20 foot wall, which is this building itself, a wall of restaurants. So the question is, how much ventilation do you really get when the only air moving is and by the way, there's a, there's a wall, there's a glass on this side and this side. So the only opportunity for ventilation is in this small space with a 20 foot wall on one side of it. And they're packed, mostly 20 to 35 year olds, maybe 40 year olds, packed, no one wearing masks, all dining and laughing and having a good time. So, and then you've got people coming in and out, the waiters and waitresses, you have people doing, like we were going to pick up food, had to step inside and wait to get our food and leave. Um, Clearly, in my view, unsafe, um, way overcrowded. The spacing amongst the dining was was two, three feet apart. The tables were people were packed six to tab table six people per tabletop. So whether you're indoor or outdoor, the real questions you have to be thinking about is ventilation. How much air movement are you getting through? That's critical. And so when you speak to uh, thinking about ventilation, um, that's what I want you to be thinking about. When you go into a space, 
how well ventilated is this space? If you go into an Uber, are the windows open or not open? If they're open, as one of my friends and patients said to me, you know, there's a you can create a wind corridor so that if the passenger rear, uh, the, the passenger front seat window is open, mm -hmm. and you're sitting in the back corner over here, the driver's up here, and then this window is open, so slightly open here, much more open here let's say it's a third open in the front passenger side and completely open in the rear behind the driver's seat, you can create a wind corridor and then having your window down a bit as well. So you can get ventilation moving as well as creating a corridor across. That's the kind of ventilation we want to be thinking about. Um, there are devices like carbon dioxide monitoring devices, which will help you get a sense of how well ventilated the room is because as CO2 goes up, obviously that we're expiring that, that means that there's not well ventilated. So there are ways to measure that. You could purchase them. I'll actually look into that, seeing if there's mobile you know, monitors that are easy to purchase that you could actually walk in a room and see how what the CO2 level is. Um, and um, I'll jot that down to, to look up. Um, as well as obviously in your home and other places, you know, HEPA filters, we have HEPA filters um, that are great. So in ours has a, a, a a LED display, which will tell us what the, at the different angstroms, at the different um, particle sizes, 2.5 and 10, what the um, concentration is. And you can watch it go down. Like I'll, we'll cook in our house, you can see the PM 10 is going up and 2.5 for that matter. And then as, as we open the windows and ventilate and turn on the filterings, it actually goes down. So these really work. It's great to have the LED monitoring to watch. Um, and of course, physical distancing and mask wearing. And if remind me if I don't bring it up, but we can talk about some of the, uh, the new variants out there and then increased contagiousness and what you should do about mask wearing. I don't think I have a slide for it. So if I don't bring it up again, let's talk about it in a bit. So this is just some graphs to look at, to look at um, mask and 95 masks. Um, what does that look like? So green line being indoor gatherings, um, purple line being energy efficient offices, Blue line being a classroom lecture, um, outdoor activities, the orange one, subway and bus rides are actually quite low because the windows are open and there's a lot of ventilation going on. And the chance of, of getting this through contact is low. Assume, and also assuming you're smart, you're not putting your hand on areas where obviously someone's just sneezed on type, type of thing. So um, if you look here in a well-fitted N95 mask, it's essentially zero right, the risk of infection. If you look at no masks in an indoor gathering, look how quite high it is, particularly in an infection hotspot. And then if you look at it with some spacing, you could see how it, it drops. And in a low infection area with, with adequate spacing, you could see how it drops even, even more. So let me just um, show you here, the, what's the effect of indoor air quality? You can see here, again, sort of a different view of that which um, you can see just looking by activity, indoor gathering, your risk goes up if it's a poorly ventilated space, right? With people talking and there's movement. Um, whereas looking at energy efficient office with a space with very low airflow and moderate talking. So less talking, but there is some airflow. Well ventilated rooms, like a classroom, ideally it's well ventilated or any other space you could see how it dramatically reduces. So again, ventilation is a huge piece of the puzzle. Subway ride, well ventilated, bus ride, decently ventilated. So really think about that. It's a critical factor. So I wanna um, talk about, um, let's talk about masks first and then we'll sort of talk about what you can do to sort of prevent yourself from getting infected and things like that. Um, so, um, mask you so you know there are more there's a couple variants out there now one out of brazil one out of the uk there's a more uh there's one that's quite concerning out of south africa um so number one piece is thinking about the infectiousness so given that things are more infectious the some of these variants are more infectious uh the thought is to actually double mask um think about using n95s um, if you're interested in N95s, I can try to procure some. So email me if you're having trouble finding some. I'm able to procure them through my medical 
a distributor and I know they're at least I'm trusting them to, that they'll be authentic. It's quite difficult to, you have to go, you can go onto the FDA website and it looks at, uh, it talks about authenticated masks and, and what to look for and look at the ones that are fraudulent. Um, but if you're interested in them, please let me know. Uh, and they're relatively inexpensive. I think they're a dollar to two dollars a mask, unlike how it used to be. Um, and so that's number one is sort of um, masking. N95s are quite good. They're hard to wear for an entire day though. Um, and the other options, what people are recommending is a surgical mask, and then on top of it, a cloth mask. Um, the cloth mask can help sort of fit that surgical mask even better. Ideally, the cloth, cloth mask may have the inserts, you know, N95 type inserts inside. Um, and then you have sort of pretty well ventilated. The key piece, or well secured, you know, protection um, and good filtering. The key piece around that is a mask fit. You wanna make sure that's secure around the nose, secure onto the cheeks and secure underneath. If you have facial hair, obviously that's a bit of a problem. It creates a bit of a leak. But so ideally it's really under the chin and being in, and has a good fit, so at least around the chin. I've seen a lot of folks with beards and it's sort of sitting out on their beard down out here. So you really, really want to try and protect that piece. And um, so that's a big part of the puzzle is really ensuring you have a good mask. Since N95s are hard to really come by for many people, a lot of the public conversation is around double masking. Um, if the hopes is just creating additional filtration and make it more difficult to breathe in. The other thing that has been talked about is wearing glasses or face shields. And I'm a fan of them, particularly on air travel, particularly in uncomfortable, well, not well ventilated situations. Um, face shields are great because they really, any, any, anything that's aerosolized really hits that face shield. So it's hard for it to come under and up um, or wearing eye, eyeglasses. In addition, protects the eyes itself from possible exposure. The other piece uh, I just wanna bring up is there is concern about the South African variant. The, um, that variant we think may be able to evade the, um, the immune response that we are developing from the mRNA uh, vaccines that we're now all eventually gonna be receiving. And for that reason, Moderna and Pfizer are, are in rapidly trying to create booster vaccines that we think that we may need to satisfy the issue of this new variant. I presume they're going to try and think ahead and think of other variant, variants or, you know, that may occur and try and answer those questions in this booster. Um, but that is a concern. Uh, the, the, the sort of rough estimates, I haven't seen any published data on this, are that you're it reduces the effectiveness by about half of this new variant. Um, the other thing, I, just to keep in mind, speaking of vaccines, when you do get vaccinated, is that the first dose actually provides a fair amount of protection. Uh, for the Moderna vaccines, about 80% benefit, we believe. In the Pfizer vaccine, about 52, I think it is, benefit at about two weeks out. Um, so um, even if you get one dose in everyone, there's a huge amount of benefit that we can see from that. So how do, uh, how do we prevent uh, getting infected? Um, I'm, you know, um, there's been a lot of sort of conversation around this Florida group uh, the, called the Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance. I think they're out of Texas and Florida, if my memory is correct. Um, and these guys have sort of come up with this protocol. The prophylaxis is a bit misunderstood by folks that have contacted me. It's not something you should just do on a regular daily basis. Uh, for, for another year sort of thing of taking ivermectin. It's really um, on exposure. So this was studied looking at folk, healthcare workers that have been exposed or, or home folks living in the home where they were exposed to someone that was a known positive. So they were exposed like in the home, known positive, what should they do? Uh, or they're constantly being exposed, working a month in the hospital. And they found um, really quite, quite beneficial outcomes and various studies that have been mostly observational studies compare, that have been comparative studies. There is at least one randomized trial that I saw. And therefore, based on some of this data, it was re-reviewed by, I believe it was the NIH that did the review of my, my recollections correct. And they changed their recommendation from do not recommend to 
um, may or may not recommend sort of a, a neutral statement until further data is available. Um, on a daily basis, so you can definitely take the nutrients here, vitamin D, vitamin C, quercetin, zinc, melatonin. I think the melatonin is a bit high of a dose for many people. Um, so if you're doing this on a regular ongoing basis, I would do a lower dose, but the, I think the immune effects are more potent at the six milligram dose, which is why they're choosing six milligrams. Typically it's one to three milligrams for sleep. Um, and, um, and some people get headache at higher doses, about five milligrams. I'm a huge fan, as many of you know, of the medicinal mushrooms for many reasons. Um, I think Paul Stamets make, from, uh, has created a, he's created a company called Host Defense. That I think they're the top quality product. So I'm a big fan of the Stamets 7, which has seven medicinal mushrooms in it. Um, and it has huge immune benefits. I'll show you in a second, another slide on that. As well as a real potent factor, as you all know, is lifestyle. So our immune system is really dependent on our, on our ability to get restorative sleep, manage our stress, um, and impute, you know, how else can we improve our immune function? Um, so exercise, stress management, getting enough sleep, relationships in contact with other people, what I call, as you know, the six pillars of healthy living. And then risk factor reduction. So we know that diabetes is a risk factor. Um, we know that many are sort of what we call classic, classically call metabolic syndrome uh, aspects. So this pro-inflammatory state, uh, which modulates our immune function in a negative way, including diabetes. Um, so really trying to address that. We've had a year to, to sort of start to optimize our health. And I think we should continue on that path, you know, trying to encourage you yourself, your family members, your friends, to really try and move down that path. If you are exposed and then turn positive, um, I have been recommending ivermectin and been prescribing it to people. I haven't been studying it, it's hard to know. I do know that everyone actually, I've had one or two patients say actually when they take the pill, they actually feel actually much better about an hour or two later. Um, that's anecdotal, uh, but it's really a very similar protocol adding aspirin because the concern for clotting. Um, uh, but otherwise really a pretty similar protocol. The ivermectin now they're recommending actually a five day course rather than just day one, day three, but actually daily for five days. Uh, the ivermectin is, is an anti-parasitic uh, medicine that's been used uh, widely across the planet um, for decades and is really quite safe and has very few interactions with any other medications. Uh, so the medicinal mushrooms, the reason I'm such a fan is there's so much research now looking at this, looking at, you know, its effects on interleukins and TNF alpha and um, microphage activity and really um, quite interesting work and clearly very little downside or any downsides to it that I know of um, and a huge amount of benefit. If you're interested in this space at all, I encourage you to listen to Paul Stamets' talks. Uh, he's given a couple great TED Talks. He's doing some great work actually looking at the effect of uh, the problem with bees. And as you know, the deformed wing um, syndrome that's occurred with many bees, which is really devastating the, the bee population. Um, the bees are, as you know, are really pr pr primarily responsible for the po pollination that occurs um, amongst all of plant life. Um, and it, this is devastating to our planet. He actually uh, has found out there's a mushroom, particular mushroom that when given to these bees, um, bring, and they bring it back to the hive, it actually kills the, I believe it's the mite that carries the virus that caused the deformed wing syndrome to the bees. And I believe it's um, 80 plus percent effective in destroying that. So it actually kills the mite that carries the virus that kills the, that deform, that eventually kills the bees and destroys the bee colony. Um, and so he's doing huge work in that as well. And generally speaking, there's a, if those that haven't seen it yet, Louis Schwartzberg has a, has a great movie called Fantastic Fungi. I think it's available on Netflix now. Um, and I encourage you guys to watch that as well. So we spoke about ivermectin um, and its use and its dosing. It's really well tolerated. Um, serious adverse effects are one in a million is really quite rare. Yeah, the main interaction is really to think about our blood thinners and that's really quite actually theoretical. And um, yeah, so that, that's really the, the, the tour I wanted to give and I wanted to spend a little time, you know, save a little time for, um, 
for any questions that you guys may have. So let me turn off the slides here and um, open up to questions. So one question is, uh, what does 95% effective mean? Does it mean that 95% are 100% affected or that 100% of the people are 95% affected? What does it mean that the South African variant reduces effectiveness that now only half of the people are protected? Great. So um, good question. So it's really a one zero phenomenon. Uh, when you're either getting infected, you're either infected or you're not. So it means that 90 to 95% effectiveness, depending on the vaccine, in those efficacy studies, right? Those are amongst 30,000 people. It's not amongst the millions that are about to get vaccinated. So we'll learn a lot more as this goes into the general population, because as we generalize this to all sorts of people, um, then we may find, oh, in these groups is actually less effective, and these groups actually more effective. But in that study, what that means is that um, 95 out of 100 people were never infected and five were. If it's reduced in half, that means that now, again, it's a one zero phenomenon. So that half are going to become infected if exposed instead of only five. So if 100 people, 50 now are infected instead of five people being infected. Um, and why is a sort of an underlying question, and we don't know, um, you know, uh, each one of us has our own unique immune response. And as you know, some people are completely asymptomatic. Some people that are, are, get quite ill. In general, we know that there's certain risk factors that you could take two 55-year-old fit, active, healthy people and one can end up in ICU and the other one could be asymptomatic. And we don't fully understand that the uniqueness of our different immune systems and how that works. We don't fully understand how vaccines work. Um, as I talk to more and more MD vaccine, PhD and MD um, vaccineologists, uh, it's really fascinating how little we know. Um, a couple of questions that were asked of me that I'll share with you that I went and learned about is, for example, what would it be like for me to take one vaccine dose of one type of vaccine and then the other one for the second? Like, we don't know the answer to that. And what we, we don't fully understand how our immune system gets primed. And so, we don't know if, it, that in, if this one vaccine, let's say the Moderna vaccine primes you in a certain direction. And then if you then take a different vaccine or let's say you get fully vaccinated, like, like a couple of folks are living overseas. So they could get a different type of vaccine that's not as effective and then come back home to the US and get the more effective vaccine. Is that a problem? Well, the answer is yes, because we don't know. We don't know if that could actually make things worse for you because it, it, one may prime it one direction and then this second vaccination process would, back, would actually prime you in a negative direction. We don't have the data. So the information I got back on that is A, we know very much uh, less than we think we know and B, um, follow the protocols, you know, follow the science of what we do know because what we don't know, we just don't know and things can go sideways. Um, if you could take one supplement, what would it be? Um, Okay, thank you, uh, John, for giving me three. So I, I would say, well, the most important, I'm, I'm going to answer this in a way that you know you, I'm going to answer, which is the most important supplement is your lifestyle, it relates to um, really our sleep and our stress, because that is the most potent supplement, quote, supplement uh, for our vitality and our immune response, hands down. If you need to then, in addition to that, take what pills would you take uh, in a preventative fashion? Uh, in my mind, it would be the medicinal mushrooms. Uh, vitamin D, if you're deficient, meaning less than 40, in my mind is deficient for these purposes. In general, I say less than 30, but for immune purposes, less than 40. <clears throat> and everyone gets tested, right? So all you guys should know your vitamin D levels. Um, and then if you give me a third, it would be zinc. Um, a short after that uh, would be, um, probably would be uh, melatonin. Okay, um, should people continue to test after the first shot? 
So I, I presume testing, you mean like testing for the virus to see if you got infected. Um, so if you get your first vaccine, um, if you got exposed and you're worried, yes. Like you're worried that you may become infected, yes. If you get, so because if you get the Pfizer vaccine two weeks after the vaccine is given, you're still only 52% you know, protected. If you then were exposed to someone, you could then get infected or transmit it to other people. So you should get yourself tested. Um, and you could argue what we don't know yet. I mean, it typically doesn't happen in most people that are vaccinated for other conditions or other viruses. But what we don't know, as you guys know, is we don't know if I'm fully vaccinated and I'm protected, can I sneeze and give it, carry my virus, carry the virus in my nose and give it to someone else? That we don't know yet, but I think we'll get the data soon. For example, um, you know, the scenario, obvious scenario is I'm fully vaccinated. I hang out with a whole bunch of people that turned out to be, have COVID. And then I go get myself tested, swab in the nose. If there's virus in my nose, it'll come out positive, right? So we'll get that data soon, but we don't have it right now. Um, I heard blood type O folks get a, a less severe reaction. I, I don't know if that means to the vaccine or to the virus. Um, there is um, blood type, yeah, there is, a, did, some of the early data did show um, a, a different severity of illness by blood type. Not much we can do about it, like you have the blood type you have, um, but that is what some of the, um, a couple different papers have shown that. I haven't looked at it recently, if anyone's contradicted that, but that, that has been shown. Um, Great, any other questions? All right, well, I will plan to um, hold conversations um, on a weekly basis. And in those conversations, we'll do a mix of a little bit of movement, uh, a, little bit of some qi, a little bit of Qigong or Tai Chi movement, as well as conversations. So we can sort of have a little bit of activity in the mix um, as well as doing some, some learning um, back and forth with each other uh, in the weeks to come. So look for that invite as well. Uh, the other thing I wanna bring to your attention, I'm gonna send an email out after we conclude today, is um, I'm about to start uh, an, a, a oxygen concentration donation drive. So those oxygen concentrators that some of you purchased, um, you may no, no longer feel the need for them now that we have adequate hospital capacity uh, the, the hospital bed, as you know, many of those, the hospital oxygen, the, the oxygenation, the oxygen concentration machines were designed to provide supplemental oxygen, not ICU level care oxygen and care, but you know, if you're on a hospital floor bed and at the time we weren't sure if there were gonna be enough hospital beds available. So many of you purchased those. Turns out there's a dire situation overseas where people cannot get enough oxygen supplies and uh, people and hospitals themselves and people are dying. So we've identified working with the Ministry of, of Health in Mexico um, through a partner of mine in Mexico, we've identified a, a couple hospitals uh, in particular that need these. And so I'm organizing a, a donation drive and a fundraising drive to bring a lot of these oxygen concentration machines if you want to donate them and get a tax deductible donation for your machine, we're gonna bring them all to Cavallo Point, get them on a truck and ship them into Mexico. So if you're interested, look for that email and uh, there's a form you'll fill out and then we'll come pick up your machine uh, from you. Uh, any questions, feel free to email me about that, but uh, you'll look for an email as well. Okay, take good care everyone and I look forward to keeping in touch. Bye-bye.